Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's the end of March, and we have five games left in the season. This one's coming down to the wire, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to break down the last week of the Flames with you. How you doing, buddy? Pumped. That win yesterday was just what the doctor ordered, and now Calgary looks like they're in the driver's seat to make the postseason. You know, I don't think that we could have had a better night of hockey than what happened Monday night. We beat the Stars. The Kings lost. Like, it seems like everything that needed to happen fell into place all in one night. And currently, Vancouver is trailing 3-2 as of the time of this recording. So hopefully Nashville can hold on for the win and make Calgary's job of getting to the postseason just that much easier. For sure. As much as we want to make our own destiny, we can always use some help. It never hurts. Who knows? We might even be able to get home ice advantage. That would be pretty amazing, wouldn't it? From the team that we thought was barely going to squeak in to being a team with home ice advantage. Crazy times. Well, let's look at the last week. Let's look at the four games that the Flames played. Uh, We started off this week since we talked last on the 24th uh, with a 4-3 overtime loss against Dallas. You were at that game. What were your thoughts on that game? I thought Calgary played well. Dallas was a desperate team, and they played like it. Calgary weathered the storm and managed to get it to overtime. Derek England had his heroics in that game, scoring a pair of goals. And unfortunately, the Flames dropped it in the shootout. Overall, it was a decent performance. Derek England scored not just two goals, but his first two goals as a Flame and his first two goals of the year in that game. So kind of an unexpected uh, milestone for Derek Derek England. I'm surprised he only had two goals. I was expecting at least a couple more from him this year. Yeah, well, he's done a very good job since Mark Giordano's gone down. He's really elevated his game. Yeah, he has. Well, everyone stepped up, and it's good to see a guy who has been criticized all year for his contract stepping up and putting in a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say effort, but maybe supporting the blue line a little bit more. Yeah, uh, you need everybody to step up just like Diaz did yesterday. Looking at that first Dallas game, the one on the 25th, I almost felt like the Flames maybe underestimated the Stars. It looked like they kind of came out and were overwhelmed by what the Stars brought. Did you get that feeling? Uh, Yeah, uh, I didn't think that Dallas had a great start despite out shooting Calgary. I think it was 11-1 at one point or whatever. <laughs> None of the shots seem to be extremely dangerous, and Dallas is a good team, but they don't have the right pieces. I, you know, they have Sagan and Ben, but not enough of like the secondary pieces that Calgary has to be a playoff team. Yeah, no, I agree with you about the start of the game. Dallas was getting more shots on, but. They weren't really quality shots, but I just felt like they came out kind of halfway through the second and kind of overwhelmed the Flames. I don't think they were expecting that much kind of a pickup in Dallas's game. No, but that's the problem when you have a team that does have superstar talents and a pretty got decent player in Alish Hemsky who can sting you if you're not paying attention. And then the Flames started their road trip after that. On Friday, they uh, lost 4-2 to two against the Minnesota Wild. And uh, I don't know, I had mixed feelings about that game. I didn't think that the Flames played as well as they could. Um, looking at the games, there, I don't think that a lot of those goals were, um, were Ramos' fault. Um, but it just it seemed like a game where the Flames weren't putting in the maximum effort. I felt like they were maybe at 60%. Yeah, uh, the first two periods, it could have gotten ugly by then. And Kari Ramo was standing on his head, and that's the only reason why it wasn't 4-5-1 or five, one heading to the second intermission. And uh, there's only so much you can ask of one player if the rest of the team wasn't picking him up. For sure. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen the goalies, you know, come to our rescue, if you will, a couple times so far this season, really, you know, save a game for us. But when I was watching um, 
Kari Ramo in that game, it was almost, to me, a Kipper-like performance of just a guy standing on his head, and as much as we lost, he really kept that game from getting away from us. Yeah, he did give the Flames the opportunity to win. It's just they couldn't get their legs under them in time. Yeah. They did have a good pushback in the last five minutes or so whenever Hiller came in, but... It was too little too late at that point. Exactly. You know, I am surprised, though, how well Devin Dubnik's been playing this year. Like, from a guy who was with the Oilers and didn't look like a good goalie, he's really turned into looking like he belongs in the NHL. Well, that's the thing with goaltenders. He's 26, if I recall correctly, and that's around the same age that Kipper was when we acquired him. Sometimes it, all it needs is to get the opportunity, and he didn't learn good habits in Edmonton like a lot of their players, and he turned his game around. Plus, when you have Ryan Suter in front of you as a defenseman, you know, that takes a lot of pressure off you. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely probably makes the goalie's job that much easier. Um, after that, the Flames took a break on Saturday and came back on Sunday where they played against the Nashville Predators. This was a game that I was a bit worried about. I thought that the Predators might be able to have their way with the Flames. But I was quite surprised watching the game that uh, it ended up as a 5-2 Flames win. And I was really happy in the second period, uh, six minutes, 57 seconds into the second to see Michael Ferlin score his first goal. Yeah, it, after all the hard work and adversity that Furland has put up throughout his life to get to the NHL, to see him finally score one at the NHL level is nice to see. Yeah, the timing was quite interesting because it came out just shortly, I think right after that, that uh, Michael Furland has been uh, sober for one year. He hasn't had a drop of alcohol. He's been dry for a whole year. I guess he got hurt and he was having problems with alcohol. And it was actually, it sounds like Brian McGratton who really helped him through that. So congratulations to him for, you know, being dry for a year and uh, congrats on the first goal. That's one that he's never for- going to forget. No, and it is good that he's gotten his head in the right place where he needs to be and battling the demons that is alcoholism and all that fun. And, you know, I was kind of surprised there was his first goal because he's played a good number of games up here this year, and I thought, wow, he he must have, you know, just in the back of my head, I was thinking he must have scored at least once before this. But, no, that was his first goal of the year. So uh, good for him. Hopefully he gets a lot more. Yeah. Three points in 22 games. Yeah, that was a nice pass by Drew Shore in the yeah, corner. It yeah, it sure was. And um, we also saw at the end of the game uh, an empty netter from Lance Bumo, which is his 16th of the year. That's not something I thought I'd be saying this season. Is Lance Bowman's 16th. He got his 15th and 16th of the year in that game. Yeah, he now has more even strength goals this season than Sidney Crosby in like 200 wow. less minutes. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, he's That's doing all right. He's, he's, he's going to be in line for a big raise this summer, I think. Yeah, well-deserved. For sure. And then not only did the Flames uh, win 5-2 to two over Nashville on Sunday, they went right the next day back to Dallas, took on the Stars again, and had a very different uh, result where they actually won 5-3 against the Stars. And the Flames had... Uh, Goals in that game from Dennis Weidman, Yari Hoodler, Rafael Diaz, Johnny Goudreau, and an empty netter from Michael Backlund. And I think to me, when I look at those goals, the prettiest goal of the night had to be the Diaz goal. Yeah, that was just uh, an amazing play by Diaz and for Lance Bulma to grab the Stars player's stick, allowing Diaz to break around the net. Yeah, and again, not a guy who we expect a lot of goals from. Generally, a player who gets his second goal of the year in March is you know, not a guy who's had a lot of NHL time, but Diaz has had a very different role to play this year. He's been more of our defensive defenseman. Yeah, he's been all right. He's played a little better lately. Anytime you're talking about your 7th, 8th defenseman, as long as they're not screwing up, it's a good thing. And he hasn't been. Diaz was signed, as we know, out of training camp. He got a, a professional tryout agreement at camp, came in as a free agent, and the Flames signed him 
to a very uh, you know cheap contract, he's making less than a million. And we talked at the beginning of the year how he was probably going to be that seventh, eighth guy. Matt, would you be surprised to know that he's played 55 games in a Flaming Sea this year? Uh, not really. With Smead being out for so long and then Giordano after that, that's why you need probably 9 or 10 NHL caliber defensemen in your system. So that way, if injuries do happen, you have at least somebody somewhat competent to throw out there. That's true. I, for, you know, I've I've almost forgot about Smead as bad as that is to say. He's he's been away for so long that I've almost forgot that he is part of this team. I know it's pretty much been since the beginning of December. Yeah, yeah. No, I I totally forgot that when uh, when I saw that Rafael Diaz had played fifty five games. I thought that's crazy. And then you're right. As soon as you reminded me of Smead, it's like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. But you know, I think that Diaz isn't going to have another summer this year, whether it's with Calgary or elsewhere where he's you know coming to training camp as a free agent. I think this is a guy who, at least for another year, has shown he can stay at the NHL level, and I think he's going to get a contract fairly early on in July. Yeah, probably. I, I could see a whole bunch of teams needing that 6th, 7th guy. So, yeah, yeah, you know, even... Even if he doubles what he's getting paid now, he's what seven hundred thousand. So even if he's getting one point four to one point six million, still a good deal. I mean, he's not going to be one of the pieces everyone's chasing on July first, but I could see him get signed in the first week of July for sure. Yeah, anybody that has his overall game and skill, he should be able to find a job somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, another another player that I've talked about in the past, especially when we've talked about Glenn Cross, of one of these guys who I would say was kind of lost at the NHL level, came to Calgary and was able to show who he really is and become more valuable after kind of, I don't know if he's going to leave Calgary, but become more valuable upon free agency. Yeah. It seems to kind of be our MO over the last couple of years. Yeah, I could see that. And, and even a guy like David Schlemko's come in since uh, being claimed off waivers from Dallas he has shown that he's worth an NHL contract as well I think he's a free agent as well he is so just further to illustrate your point of guys coming in that are unheralded and showing that they're improving and worthy at least of a new contract whether it's here or elsewhere so after this past week of flames hockey and nhl hockey in general the flames now sit seventh in the west and third in the pacific division so you know that makes me quite happy because i thought we were going to be chasing the last wild card spot i wasn't expecting us to be sitting in third in the pacific really at any point uh down the stretch here no and it's a testament to the flames determination and literally willing themselves to a playoff spot you know, that's a good way of putting it. I didn't think of it that way. But, yeah, I mean, as much as we saw some rough games this week from the Flames, every time we see some rough games and we thought they were out, they've come back like they did this week and had a great back-to-back. It's like, you know, this team just needs sometimes, it seems like, to get their feet under them and then they're good again. Yeah, and even uh, when you have a team like Dallas who was fighting for their slimmest of playoff hopes yesterday – in the third period they threw everything in the kitchen sink at calgary and the flames managed to find a way to hold on and that included gaudreau sacrificing his body in the last minute with a couple of nice plays as well yeah we weren't expecting that that was kind of crazy especially when he blocked a shot yeah it shows that all the players have bought in to fight for the letter on the front of the jersey instead of the name on the back well and we're finally seeing i think you know not just down the stretch here but all season we're seeing what we as flames fans knew needed to happen in the past we were seeing these guys on the flames team playing like individuals and it seemed like a bunch of freelancers who all just happened to wear the same jersey and i think this year more than any time i can remember in my you know history as a flames fan we're seeing the team play like a team yeah uh, the only other time i can recall anything even remotely close to this is 2004 not to say that we'll have the same success in the playoffs but that bonding as a team and like everybody fighting for each other it's good to see yeah you know 
2004 was a long time ago. I It's hard to remember your exact thoughts there. But yeah, I guess you're right. That team was pretty much had the same kind of regular season story as we do this year. The team that wouldn't give up. Yeah, because like Calgary back then wasn't exactly a skilled team. It was basically no. the Ginla and Kipper show, and that was it. Well, but, you know, anytime, and I've said this on this show too, I mean, if, if you look at that roster, that was everyone else's leftovers. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, to the same certain extent, that's what this roster is as well. It's mainly a bunch yeah. of kids with r- some random UFAs thrown in the mix. Yeah, I'd say the difference this year is that we actually have, I guess, some proven players who've come out of our system you know, highly touted prospects like Johnny Gaudreau, you know, younger players who are going to make a difference here. And I, I can't really say that we had that in 03, 04. No. <laughs> that was more of a veteran laden team than this year's is. True. I mean, if we look at, if we look at some of the younger players on the roster, even some of the older players, you know, we had Jerome McGinley, Craig Conroy, uh, both kind of elder statesmen, um, you know, some of the younger players were like Jordan Leopold, Matthew Lombardi, Oleg Saprikin, um, Chris Clark. Like, it was a lot of younger players, but not a lot of guys who we could say, okay, this is a blue chip piece to build around on the young side. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why the Flames floundered for the years afterwards, not quite hitting the highs that I think a lot of Flames fans were expecting. Yeah, well, that's it, is we had one good year, and there wasn't much to build on. It was the veterans, and that's what they built on. They built on the veterans because they had to. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I think that's maybe the the difference here is we're seeing the young players contributing so much more. Mm-hmm. And that's all part of the fact that the Flames, the last, like, four or five drafts have had their best draft since the 1980s. So we're getting yeah. legitimate good players instead of hoping that whomever we've drafted since basically Theron Fleury hoping that they'd figure it out and not really having that occur at any point point. and even if you look at the fringe players you know if you look at a guy like Mike Furland who's played you know about uh, 22 games here and we compare that to some of the fringe players who've, who played about that in in you know the 2000 uh 2003 2004 season a guy like Lynn Loins who played 12 games i think that you're going to see these young players playing a much bigger role in their career you look at someone like Martin Sonnenberg who played you know just a couple games there who we've heard nothing from i think if we look 10 years or 20 years in the future we're going to have less guys who faded into oblivion from this team this year than we did in 2003 2004 Oh, definitely. You know, Chris Clark seemed to fade into nowhere. Um, you know, Lynn Loins, Martin Sonnenberg, Brennan Evans. I'm sure some of them are still playing in lower leagues, but I think you're going to see more of this Flames team be around the NHL or the AHL for a lot longer. I just think that it's it's a better built young team. Yeah. They might not all be wearing Flames jerseys, but... Well, Calgary is more on the same trajectory that the Chicago Blackhawks were in 2006-2007 after they got Taze and Kane, where they had a whole bunch of good quality young players coming into the system all at the same time. And, you know, I'm hoping in a couple of years the Flames have a similar result that Chicago did back then, but, you know, there's a lot of good talent coming through. And it's nice to see. Yeah. It's a completely different animal than the teams that Flames fans have gotten accustomed to for the last 25 years. And, you know, in the 2003 entry draft, the year before we went on that run, uh, the big player, our big prospect, in 2003, the Flames used the ninth overall selection to select defenseman Dion Phaneuf. And so that was at the time the guy that we were all waiting to see in a Flames jersey. And again, I think if we compare that now, the guy that we drafted this past year who we're waiting to see, Sam Bennett, I think even in that condition, we have the you know the better of the two um, blue chip prospects. I agree. 
And speaking of Sam Bennett, his team is in the playoffs, and they lost again today and are down 3 nothing in their series to North Bay. So I believe they play tomorrow or the next day. Uh, so if they lose the and get swept, uh, Bennett could be here for the Arizona game, hypothetically, next week. That could be interesting to see. Even even if he's not on the ice, I would expect them to have him join the team just so he's working out and practicing at the NHL level and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he might draw into a game or two. Like, I could see them throwing him out there for the Kings and the Jets game just to get experience, maybe. I think that a lot of that's going to depend where we are in the standings and where everybody else is, too. Yeah, like if we've clinched by the LA game, I think you get Bennett for a game or two and see whether he, you would want to use him in the playoffs. Yeah, no, I, I think you could definitely be right there. The And I know this sounds bad, but the thing I'm most interested to see if Bennett comes on the ice this year, I mean, I know he's going to be a good player. I'm not too worried about is he going to play well. What number is he going to wear? Is he going to wear 39 or 93 and break the you know Burke rule, or are they going to give him some number like 20? Because he has to wear it. Well, he'll likely wear number 63, which was his training that's camp true. number. Yeah, no, that's true. Just that's for this year. Number. Yeah, just for yeah, this right. year and then figure out next year. You're right. So an interesting stat I found today from uh, Darren Haynes of um, the Canadian Press. Uh, he he tweeted on Twitter today that the Flames have played to a 94 point fa- point pace in the final 34 games last year you remember that's when the flames started to get hot which means if we combine that with this year where they've been playing to a 96 where they've been playing really well they've been playing to a 96 point pace for the last 111 games that's crazy i mean that's more than a whole season they've been playing in a at a playoff pace yeah they've been kind of all right for a while now <laughs> ever since hartley told tortorella off in the Canucks locker room area uh, that really seemed to turn Calgary around. That really is. I mean, if you have to pinpoint something, that's really what did it, isn't it? Yep. As we're speaking, the New York Rangers just scored to take the lead on the Winnipeg Jets, so good. (laughs) The interesting thing that they've been playing to a 96-point pace for 111 games, the maximum number of games a team could play in a year is 110. If they were to go seven games in four rounds, that's 28 additional games plus 82. So they've been playing pretty much to a 96-point pace all the way through a fictitious playoff run, if you will. Yeah, and it's a good thing for the younger players to have built some consistency into their game even though they have no experience at the nhl level or very little and being able to play at a near playoff pace for that duration yeah no that's that's really nice to see from all these guys and just one more note before we uh get into some more discussion for the week uh the bill master the bill masterton memorial trophy which is given out every year uh by the Professional Hockey Writers Association is awarded to the National Hockey League player who best exemplifies the qualities of perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to ice hockey. Um, And what they do, it sounds like, is they put in one nomination from every team and then it's voted on. So every chapter, every, you know, professional writers group in each franchise puts their nomination forward. And this year's nomination for the Flames was Chris Russell. I heard a lot of people thinking that Lance Buma should be that uh, nominee, but I think that Russell's a fine nominee for Calgary. Not the guy I would expect to be nominated for an NHL award, but a guy who's had a great season so far. Well, he's, I think, what, four shots so, shot blocks away from the NHL record? So Is he? Yeah. Is he that close? Yep. Huh. He should be able to break that before the end of the season and yeah he's done everything that you can ask like you know when you're blocking 270 ish shots in a year that's definitely dedication and perseverance to the game of hockey if i've ever seen it yeah and i mean you know sportsmanship is in there he's only had 17 penalty minutes all season so, you know, not, not necessarily a Bing, uh, Lady Bing candidate, but definitely a guy who's showing good sportsmanship. 
Um, I, I, I don't know. I, Russell, I think, hasn't got some of the appreciation he deserves this year. But I think we saw it last year, and we're starting to see it again this year. He's really starting to become a good 3-4 defenseman in this league and a guy that I think is going to be highly sought after by other teams in the future and a great piece in our rebuild because of that. Yeah, definitely. And I think that he might even be a number one, number two defenseman on some teams. That's how much well, that's, his game's improved. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. He'll never be in that role. Well, I won't say never. He won't be permanently in that role here because I think our number one, two is very well established. But because you're right, he could probably be in that role on other teams. Somebody might be willing to pay a king's ransom to get him. True. And it, we have to just wait and see how this team evolves over the next coming years to see if this year was just an aberration or if he will actually emerge even more so next year. Sort of like the steps that both Giordano and Brody took from last year to this year. Yeah, no, that's true, and I think we've, I think we have seen Russell taking a lot of those steps. Perhaps not as, you know, as much as Brody, um, but he's definitely, definitely shown. I think the most improvement we've seen of any year of his in, in the past. I, I can't, I can't look at him um, any other year in his career and say, wow, he's made a huge transition here. No, in previous years, he was more of a fringy NHL player at best and probably only stayed in the NHL because of his offensive talents. So like the defensive yeah. game that he has put up this year is actually, it's improved a lot, not just the offense and even then the offense hasn't been quite as good either so which shows how much he's improved as a player where his offensive numbers aren't quite as good and yet he's an even more important player than what he was last year let me read here the actual submission from the calgary chapter of the professional hockey writers association about russell Russell was acquired by the Calgary Flames shortly after going unclaimed through waivers in the summer of 2013 and has flourished in the Stampede City. A product of Caroline, Alberta, he's responded with consecutive seasons setting a high for points, but that's only part of the 27-year-old defenseman and alternate of what the 27-year-old defenseman and alternate captain has provided. Pound for pound, Russell's listed as being 5 foot 10, 173 pounds. He may be one of the toughest defensemen you'll find in the NHL and has displayed that attribute not only by his efforts in the corners and in front of the net battling opponents, but also blocking shots. The NHL leader in that category, he set a league record of 15 blocks during a win over the Boston Bruins in early March. After the Flames lost Captain Mark Giordano to a season-ending bicep injury, Russell's value showed even more, logging more ice time than usual while elevating his game at both ends of the rink. Very well said by the Calgary chapter of the Professional Hockey Writers Association. I think that definitely sums up everything we could say about him in one ge- in one year. Can't argue with that. A guy who sets a league record with 15 block shots in one game. That right there is telling you that this guy's got dedication to the league and his craft. I hope that he becomes one of the non like the finalists for that trophy as well. Me too. There's two Flames that have won the trophy in the past. Uh, Lanny McDonald won it in 1983, and Gary Roberts won it in 1996. So if he does win, he's in great company there. So Matt, this past week, uh, we've seen both Flames goaltenders 10 net. We saw Hiller start the week, or sorry, we saw Ramos start the week and Hiller end the week for the Flames. And as we've talked about a lot, we don't really have a number one goalie. We have Two guys who are both able to play number one. Two guys who are both able to, um, you know, carry the load here. But excuse me, we're down to the final five games of the of the season. Which goaltender would you ride into those final five games? How would you break down these five games and which goalie you'd play? I would start Kari Ramo against the St. Louis Blues and then play it by ear after that. Jonas Hiller. Why start Ramo? Uh, because 
Jonas Hiller in both the Nashville game and the Dallas game, he made some good saves, but he did not... The goals that he allowed in both games were not goals that a starting goaltender in a stretch run should be giving up. And Calgary was able to overcome that, but we need wins. And despite Ramo giving up four goals to Minnesota, he, he was not responsible for the loss. And I think that Ramo having a couple of days off, the weekend off, and being fresh for St. Louis should give him enough time to get better and let him have the opportunity to take the starting role once again. I just don't think that Hiller, like especially the first goal in both games, those were some pretty terrible goals by Hiller. So I don't know. Like I just feel more comfortable in that with Ramo. And Rommel will have we'll had five days rest before the St. Louis game, so that's definitely going to help as well. He was playing it almost, a, you know, a game every other day clip for a while there. Yeah, and that's not to say that I'm ragging on Hiller. It's just these games all matter until the Flames clinch a playoff spot. So uh, I, you know, you go with the player that's the least likely to screw up and the goals that Hiller allowed in his last two starts haven't been exactly good where Ramo hasn't really surrendered many stinker goals in the last month. Yeah. uh, You know, I'd have to go back and look throughout the year at who started what game and see how the whole team played in front of them as well. Uh, I don't know if the team is playing a different way in front of each goaltender, but it did seem like, especially in that uh, game against the the Wild last week, that as soon as they switched goaltenders, the whole team played differently. And they seemed like they were playing better in the last three games for Hiller. Yeah. I think also Hiller has, I mean, not last year, but Hiller has a record of being a goaltender that has playoff experience and knows what it takes to get there. So I think that the brass probably... Um, you know, might rely on him for that. I agree with you. I think we could put, uh, I would put Hiller in against the the Blues if I was the coach, but I'd be okay putting Ramo in and uh, see what happens from there. I think that we've got five games left. Somebody's going to get an odd number of games from here if you play them, you know, equally. But you've also got to decide who do you want to play down the stretch and who do you need to be ready for the playoffs as well. And I think there's a bit of a balancing act to be uh, managed there. Yeah, and... Having Hiller play a, a couple of games in the last five would allow both goaltenders to be fresh for the playoffs. I think each guy should get some games. It's just until the Flames clinch, uh, they'd be better off with the more sure thing. And if you that's all, yeah. And if you look at that from a business perspective too, I think as soon as you start giving Hiller. Uh, or sorry, giving Ramo starts in the playoffs, you're pretty much saying this guy's got to come back next year because you're not going to give him playoff starts and then just let him walk. So I'm still waiting for the shoe to drop there and for that contract to be signed. Yeah, and at this rate, I would actually probably would retain Ramo and look to trade Hiller yeah, next year, like heading into next year. You know, we've got but we'll we've see. got the cap room. I figure keep them both and see what deals are on the table next year. If we have to, run with both of them. Yeah. It'll be fun. I'm not... Well, lots of time for that whole discussion, though. Yeah, well, exactly. And we can talk about, you know, how audio factors in there, but I'm thinking, and I've been thinking this over the last week, with audio being hurt... I'm not sure he's going to be ready to go at the end of the year next year. I mean, he he's had a slow start the last couple of years already, plus coming off an injury. We might want to keep both these guys around to start the season in a flaming C. Yeah, true enough. As opposed to a flaming S, is that what you'd call the new Stockton logo? I don't even know what we would describe that as. Clip art? <laughs> a big S? I, I don't know. It's not really flaming. There's a flame in the middle of it. I don't know. We'll have to come up with some catchy name for it. So, yeah, I, I I think we're both probably in agreement there is uh, 
start one guy in in uh, St. Louis and and go from there. See how they look, and you know you you can easily make a change midway through a game or just rotate them every other if you want to. And I think at this point that might be our best bet to keep both guys fresh, uh, make sure they're both getting minutes. Is just you know play them every other. Yeah, it it depends on the whole playoff scenario because we won't know exactly how things are until we get closer to game time each game on how much pressure the team is under until the puck drops. True, true. And I think, you know, the nice thing about that too is it makes it harder for other teams to scout us. You know, if they're not sure which guy we're going to play, it makes it a lot harder for some of these guys to watch the video footage. And anytime you can keep them on, on their feet, I always think that's a good thing. Yeah. Exactly. Well, moving out from the net a little bit for some more Flames news. We talked last week about the signing of NCAA uh, free agent Kenny Morrison, uh, who the Flames signed from Western Michigan. And I was surprised that he's made a debut in the Flames organization already. He came in this past week wearing number eight and played for the Adirondack Heat. Um, I didn't see that game. Or, sorry, the Adirondack Flames. Um, what, What did you think... Um, of his performance in that game uh he was able to score his first professional goal on an interesting play where he shot the puck in uh, to clear it into the zone and let it skip off the glass and picked up the rebound and fired it before anybody realized what he was doing and he also collected a pair of assists for a three-point night i saw the goal on youtube and yeah, it seemed like no one was quite sure what was going on. He put the puck in the net, and you saw some uh, players in the other team kind of looking around, like, "What just happened?" Well, that's good. And he, in the game, his first shift, he got beat rather badly by one of the opposition forwards. But after that, his game defensively settled right down, and he played really well. Uh, not quite as good as a guy like Tyler Waterspoon, but not far off. But offensively, it was like watching Chris Russell or TJ Brody out there. He was throwing long bomb passes from our zone right to the opposition blue line. He broke in quite a few times, made the nice play on the goal. It's a little early and it's only one game, but he looked like an NHL defenseman playing at the AHL level. I was going to say, if we can compare him to Tyler Watherspoon, who's been in the Flames organization playing at the professional level for a number of years, or even a guy like TJ Brody in his first game, that tells me that we potentially have quite a good defenseman on our hands here. Yeah, I would be shocked if he was not in the NHL next year at some point. Uh, He looked really good i know it's one game and you know anybody can have one good game but the fundamentals of his game were very strong and his you could see his decision making he was making the right plays just like when tj brody knows when to pinch and when not to it was all those little things he was doing the right thing and that's the thing that you'd have to look for not so much the end result of oh he scored three points but how he did uh, how he approached the game on the ice yeah no it's good to hear and you know when you were saying that he's had a little bit of jitters it sounds like in his first shift i totally would have expected that i mean there's a guy who's playing at another level a level he hasn't been at before so it's good that he could kind of calm it down after only one shift often we see it take a lot longer yeah it it was like oh okay this is how it is okay let's go made the quick adjustment and uh, adapted almost instantaneously and there was no he didn't get beat obviously by anybody the remainder of the game he was quite good at keeping the players where they were supposed to be on the other team so he played really well and, you know, we can't judge a guy by one game, but it's very promising, and we'll see how he does down there for the remainder of the season. Exactly. And it, as long as he plays like that, he will be in the NHL in no time. It's just 
having to see, okay, you've done this in the first game, let's see what you do the second, the third, the fourth, and so on. Yeah, no, it's, that's good to hear. I'm, I'm quite pleased to hear that. Yeah, it's better than having him come in and stink up the joint. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say so. I don't think anyone expected him to stink up the joint, but I'm just thinking, you know, it might have taken him a little while to adjust to the pro level of the game. Sure, we've, see, and we've it seen didn't that take with other very long at all. We've seen that with other college free agents uh, that the Flames have brought in, in the past. Yeah, like Josh Juris, for example, he it took him a full year plus to adjust. Even a guy like Bryce Van Brabrand, then... who they brought up last year, but didn't look ready to me at all. Yeah, and those guys have come in and they've adapted. And like even Kenny Augustino has played a lot better this year in the tail end of the season than he did in the first half. Yeah, no, we'll see. Very true. Well, that about wraps it up for Flames news this week. But we thought we'd pass on an interesting uh, new rule that the NHL is working on. Uh, the Board of Governors passed this rule last year. And they finally got some wording around it. And it's the compensation the teams will be due for hiring a new executive or for hiring executives already under contract. And you and I were a bit confused by this rule before the show. So we'll try to break it down for everybody. And this would have included the Flames last year because we hired a GM who was already under contract. So the rule is going to read, if in the off season, a team were to hire a general manager, head coach, or president of hockey ops that is under contract already, the team doing the hiring must give up a third round pick if it's in the off season. If it's in season and they hire a coach, GM, or president of hockey ops that's under contract, the team must give up a second round pick. I would imagine that that pick would be the next one available. I doubt they could pick the year, so if they've got a second this year, they'd probably have to give it up. Do you think that's a fair assumption? Yeah. And we were we were confused by this, but here's how we're interpreting it, Matt and I. And tell me if your interpretation is different, Matt, but this is what we got from our conversation before the show. You generally don't have a head coach go to another head coaching job. So these job titles are the job titles of the new team they're going to. So, for example, we hired um, Brad Treliving, who is an assistant general manager in Phoenix, but brought him in as the general manager in Calgary. So because he's being hired into the role of general manager, we would we would have had to give up a third round pick. Actually, it would have been a second because the executives, their season ends after oh, right. the draft. Yeah, that's and right. And we the, hired them at before. Right. So what is it, the coaches? Their season ends as soon as their team is done and the executives or the GM and president of hockey ops season is right after the draft, right? Yes. So we snuck in under the wire because I don't want to give up a second this year. So I'm glad we got that done last year. Yeah, and uh, that'll be be an interesting situation moving forward because I know a lot of teams value second and third round picks quite heavily. And uh, I, for one, would rather look on who doesn't have a contract and pick from there if it's going to cost a really good asset. Well, I think because of that, you're you're probably going to see a lot more new faces enter the NHL because, yeah, teams might say, you know what, we really want this guy, but we don't want to give up a second form, so we'll take this guy from the AHL or something like that instead. So I think we'll see probably a lot more one-term GMs because that guy will kind of be there while they wait out somebody else leaving their team. And yeah. it's... It's just a little weird that I wonder if they will be bringing back the availability to make trades of executives for assets. Well, that's what we were talking about before the show, too. Yeah, I mean, if you're giving up an asset for an executive, I wonder if you could, say, trade your coach. Yeah, because that might make sense. Uh, You know, because if a team, say, like, uh, some team wants Martin Jelena to be their new head coach, well... Calgary could hypothetically, in a scenario where trades are allowed, trade him for a fourth or a prospect it, where they might not sign Jelena and waste the third or the second. So, who knows? Well, and, and I'm waiting to see the teams that are going to try and get around this rule. Like you are saying, if somebody wanted Marty Jelena to be their, their head coach, like... I can see you maybe taking Jelena and making him your AHL head coach. That's his official position when he gets signed. And then two days later you go, oh, we've decided to promote him to our NHL head coach. 
Yeah, I, I don't think the NHL would look too kindly on that. No, though. but <laughs> I, I can see it happening at least once. Somebody trying to, you know, to do this. Oh, yeah. You got to push the rule book. You ain't trying if you're not trying to find a way around the rules. And, I mean, even a couple of years ago when we saw uh, Bruce Boudreaux get fired by Washington, and then a day later he became the head coach of Anaheim. Like, you know, to me, that's the, the kind of situation where I don't know if it's against the rules or just nobody does it, but that's the kind of thing where you think, okay, trading a coach might have been worthwhile. Yeah, we'll see. There, uh, It's a new field, so you don't know exactly how they will play ball with it. You know, I wonder if you'd see some teams stock up on, like, all of the guys that people want to bring in, you know, all the, like, next NHL head coach guys. Make them all your assistant coach just so people want to hire them from you and you get a bunch of draft picks. Yeah, stock your AHL with like the all star cast of, you know, soon to be NHL coaches. Yeah, what? Well, sort of like what Calgary did with Ryan Huska. Similar, yeah. Or even, yeah, I mean, even before him, you know, Jim, Jim Playfair, um, you know, was hired. I think we'd already fired him, but I also wonder if this means we're going to see more resignations. Like, you know, I wonder if we would see a guy like Treliving who would resign and then the week after be hired in Calgary. I don't know how the contracts work as far as resignations, but I know we've seen GMs in the past who've resigned. Yeah, it's all up in the air. I don't know exactly how the structure of this will break out. It's something to look at in the future to see how it gets implemented yeah i do think because if it's just a if it's just a strict like you're getting rid of a third or a second round pick regardless if the guy resigns or this or that or if you're not allowed to trade for the coach or gm or whatever it there's a lot that has to be gone through in the legalese in order to flesh out exactly what constitutes what see and and i'm not a fan of telling teams what that compensation has to be you know i would much rather say hey if you want to negotiate with somebody just like with any player you guys hash out a deal together you know there has to be some compensation you guys figure out what that's going to be if somebody says you know what we're planning to fire a coach anyways give us a seventh we're happy or if there's a team say like calgary who was looking at what some people said was the next nhl gm Maybe they say, you know what, you can talk to him, but you know it's going to cost you a seventh just to talk to him, and we want a third if he signs. Like, to me, I think that should be between the individual teams, not necessarily the league mandating it. Yeah, I don't know. It's one of those. It's so murky the whole situation because, like in the past, before the 2005 lockout, there was no set price tags for the acquisition of coaches and such. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And then it, it, sometimes uh, teams received no compensation. Other times there was draft picks traded. Because I recall uh, Mark Crawford got, I think, a second round pick in it when he moved from Colorado to Vancouver. And if I remember correctly, I think even last year, um, Brian Burke said that they waited to talk to Treliving or to sign Treliving because they were going to have to pay um, the Coyotes a compensation. Yeah. I wonder if I were to hire somebody's assistant coach, let's say, and make them into a coach and GM, do I have to give up two second round picks? I know, that's where the whole thing has not been fleshed out, so we don't know. So we should say this was reported today on TSN, so I'll be curious to see what the actual wording that goes into the collective bar I guess it would be the collective bargaining agreement this summer would be. Well, Matt, any other Flames news we've missed? Uh, just one thing. The magic number for the Flames to clinch is 4.5. So a combination of Flames wins and Los Angeles losses needs to be 4.5. So if Calgary wins two games, Los Angeles loses two games, and there's an overtime loss somewhere in there, Calgary will make the postseason. So hopefully by the time that we talk next week, we hit that. So we're looking for about a four and a half point spread at this point. Wins. So nine points in total. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's hope that we've clinched by next week.
Yeah, I want the two games at the end of the season against Los Angeles and Winnipeg to not matter whatsoever. That'd be nice. That's when you bring in guys like Bennett and maybe even Kenny Morrison and just let them, you know, play to see what we got there. Well, I don't think uh, Morrison's eligible to play this season. Okay. No. Interesting. All right. Well, maybe Watherspoon will finally get a shot. He's been called up enough and never actually got to wear wear the flaming sea this season. So maybe you bring him up. Who knows? Well, let's lots of fun this week and go Flames, go get the win against St. Louis and Edmonton. Well, let's look ahead at the week, but before we do, let's take a look at how we did last week in our predictions. Uh, last week there were eight points on the table. I was optimistic and thought the Flames would get six of them. You were less optimistic, thought the Flames would split them and get four of those eight. Um, and we ended up for the third week in a row, neither of us getting the right answer. We had five points on the week, which means we still sit. With me in the lead at four to two. The previous week we did the exact opposite. I had six, you had four, and it was five then too. It's just one of those weird things. So maybe we should pick that we are gonna get the full points and then two points less than that. So. <laughs> well, there's only two games this week, so that should make it easier to predict. We've got uh, the Blues on Thursday, and we've got. What I'm hoping to be for the first time in as long as I can remember, a Battle of Alberta that actually means something on Saturday because hopefully that's going to be a big uh, game to get the Flames into the playoffs. Oh, I'm going to go with the full four points. I think we're going to mop the floor with both the Blues and the Oilers. I'm going to... I think we might, but knowing the Flames' record against teams above us recently, I'm looking at some of them, I'm going to take a bit of a gamble and I'm going to say three points. I think we beat the Oilers handedly and I think we might get a point in overtime against the Blues. Well, it depends on uh, how much tactics uh, St. Louis wants to bring into this. If you look at how the standings are, uh, if they catch Nashville, then they'll have to face, likely will have to face the Minnesota Wild in the first round. If they don't catch Nashville, then they're going to play Chicago. And if, you know, looking at how the two teams have been playing the last three months, I wouldn't want to face the Minnesota Wild in the first round. So, tactically, St. Louis might go easy on us, I'm hoping. Play the backup (laughs) goalie, maybe play the HL starter, something like that. Yeah, and maybe not push for you know like go all out to win we'll see sort of like what nashville did on uh sunday so we'll see this this is kind of i think a lot of i think the contending teams don't want la to make the playoffs (laughs) so we might see some preferential treatment from st louis yeah i'm just thinking of of the five games the flames have left if there's one of those 